Imagine a world without Google. No, seriously, a world without Google. A world where you couldn't do detailed reconnaissance on your blind date for tomorrow night. A world where you couldn't find out with the click of a mouse the GDP of Kazakhstan. A world where if you're not feeling well, you can't just sit down at your computer and figure out whether to just pop a couple aspirin or whether you need to call 911. It's amazing, right? Just 10 years ago, there was no Google. And five years before that, there was no way at all to search the internet. And that posed a big problem. Because really, what use was the World Wide Web if you couldn't navigate it and get where you wanted to go? The companies that took a stab at search included some of the most iconic names in the history of the net, like Yahoo and Excite. But even though the guys who started those outfits were some of the brightest young things in the annals of American business, in the end, they found themselves unable to crack the code. Then a pair of super brainy, super nerdy 20-somethings solved the search problem. I'm gonna tell you how they did it and how they became multi-billionaires in the process. My name is John Heileman, and as a journalist, I've covered the search revolution from the start. The story I'm here to tell you is about the high-tech innovations that underpin that revolution, and about the enormous economic upheaval that it unleashed. It's an exciting tale full of fierce ambition and ingenuity, full of opportunities seized and opportunities missed, and secret maneuvers and meetings that have never come to light, until now, that is. On the web today, you type my name, John Heileman, into a search engine and boom, in a third of a second, you can find out instantly that I'm a magazine journalist and peruse a catalog of pretty much everything I've ever written. Given that there are over 150 million websites and billions of web pages out there, the technology that makes super accurate search possible is kind of a miracle. And it's a miracle that most of us have come to take entirely for granted. We forget that a little more than 10 years ago, this is what the web looked like page after page of plain text, long lists of underlined sentences. Finding what you were looking for on the web was damn near impossible. There was no way to search for anything. All you could do was follow links and hope that luck would land you somewhere useful. To understand how we've come so far, how the web search miracle happened, we have to go back to the time before Google, to the story of the companies like Yahoo and Excite that paved the way for its existence and became its fiercest rivals, and to a little place in California that you may have heard something about. Silicon Valley, California. This 30-mile stretch is the place to be for people with a knack for inventing the future and an appetite for getting enormously rich in the process. It's the home of legendary tech names like Apple and Intel and Oracle. But the heart of Silicon Valley, the real wellspring of the high-tech industry, the source of countless great ideas, isn't any company. It's Stanford University. And it's here at Stanford where the roots of search can be found. Now you might think I'm gonna tell you that in a lab around here somewhere, some straight A students and their brainy professor were inventing some new mega fast silicon chip or some massive supercomputer that was gonna take the valley by storm. And there were, but we're not interested in that. We're interested in a couple of slackers named Jerry Yang and David Filo, who were left to their own devices when their professor went on a year-long sabbatical. While Jerry and David were goofing around, they hit on an idea that would become the basis for one of America's best-known businesses and turn them into billionaires. Today, their company is called Yahoo, and it's among the most traffic sites on the web. all began when Jerry and David were trying to find a sneaky way to use the internet to win a Stanford Fantasy Basketball League. The boys were electrical engineering students, and they had access to the web. They scoured it laboriously, site by site, looking for up-to-date sports information. David figured out how to go to all these different places to get all the data from the previous night's basketball games. Pulled it all in, and crunch data and try to figure out what, you know, we should change players or trade players or do whatever. It's hard to imagine more trivial pursuit than fantasy basketball, but in hunting around for obscure sports data on this weird clunky network called the internet, Jerry and David were taking the first steps on the road to search. And you know, at the time we were competing with other students from other departments. We were 
you know, trying to use technology as an edge, and they were basically reading the newspaper the next day and, you know, doing stuff on the papers. And I don't think we, did we win by much? I don't think we, we won. <laughs> we did win, but we didn't win by much. So I'm not sure the technology helped us by all that much, but it was kind of a fun experiment. It's not surprising that the web circa 1994 didn't help Yang and Philo much. Even to understand what this thing was and what, ha what the internet had to offer, you needed some kind of guide, you needed some kind of directory to kind of help you kind of navigate through that. This was a simple but brilliant thought, a directory that could show virgin web users how to find cool stuff in this new electronic world. But it was nothing like search today. It was just a bunch of categories and subcategories that you could hunt and peck around in. It was incredibly crude, compiled manually by a pair of geeks who spent hours looking at as many websites as possible, then deciding how to list them. Crude or not, though, what the guys called Jerry and David's guide to the World Wide Web was the first thing of its kind, and it proved immensely popular. Literally overnight, it was this worldwide thing. Millions of users from around the globe flocked to the site. The guys soon realized that they needed a shorter, snappier, punchier name, one that sounded kind of, you know, exciting. Yeah. Yahoo was a great idea, but a great idea isn't enough to become a great company. It requires money, and lots of it. But as everyone knows, there's no shortage of cash in Silicon Valley. Most of it emanates from these buildings along Sand Hill Road, the offices of many of the Valley's legendary venture capitalists. I don't know what I expected to see the first time I came to this place. Streets paved with gold or something. But this is what I found. A bunch of nondescript, low-slung office buildings in what looks like an alpine village. But behind those doors over there sit the venture capitalists, the guys who preside over investment funds containing billions and billions of dollars, the guys who ultimately decide which startups get a chance to live and which never see the light of day. One of the most successful VC firms is Sequoia Capital. Its most famous partner, Michael Moritz, decided to pay Yahoo's young founders a visit in their Stanford trailer. Inside of it was a scene of total confusion. This was every mother's worst nightmare. Pizza cartons all over the place, computers and electronic equipment scattered hither and yon, the curtain shades drawn, temperature of about 85 degrees. It was a sweltering cesspit. It was a mess. There were lots of reasons to be skeptical about making an investment in Yahoo. It was only two people. The uh, business model was, to be generous, hazy. What Moritz couldn't ignore was the potential of Yang and Philo's web directory. It seemed to us fairly straightforward that anybody who uh, was offering a service that acted as a guide to all this stuff that otherwise was difficult to uncover with the passage of time offered the potential of occupying rather strategic ground. Moritz invested $2 million in Yang and Philo's website, but it was a gamble based on little more than a hunch. The large numbers of people visited the Yahoo site, it wasn't obvious where profits or even revenue would come from. We had a company, we had to figure out a way to make money somehow, and up to that point we had no revenue at all. Actually, it was worse than that. At the time, no one on planet Earth had figured out how to make money on the internet. But Yahoo would change all that, and in doing so, help launch the gold rush that would soon engulf the web. In 2007, search companies such as Yahoo and Google generated billions of dollars in revenue and profits, making them the envy of entrepreneurs everywhere. But at the dawn of the web, no one used it for business or commerce. The very idea was considered heretical, even evil, by some. I vividly remember the debates as the web tried to define its culture. In the mid-1990s, the center of the web culture wasn't in Silicon Valley. It was here in this little park on the south edge of San Francisco. Just up the street, Wired Magazine and its online sister, Hot Wired, were launched. I was working here at the time, and the arguments around the impending commercialization of the web were fierce. And they boiled down to just one word, advertising. Advertising split the early web community. On one side were venture capitalists and other financial types who figured that the internet was a new kind of medium, and media had always been supported by advertising. You know, there was a hundred years of media history behind it, which said, 
if you can gather a large audience in one place, you're gonna be able to sell them advertising. You did not have to have much more intelligence than that housed between the ears of a newt to be able to figure that out. On the other side were the internet utopians, people who saw the web as a place that promised freedom. Yeah, there wasn't a commercial environment. People weren't, these weren't businesses. This was just a bunch, in general, a bunch of university students, research folks that were experimenting with this new thing. But Yang and Philo had taken venture capital. They were in the game to build a business. They had to find a way for Yahoo to make money, anyway. Jerry and David were very concerned about the ramifications and repercussions of putting advertising up on their website for fear that this was bad for the, their users uh, and the users would rebel. For the Yahoo founders, this posed a serious dilemma. Taking advertising risked alienating their loyal users. But there weren't really any other viable options. What else could they do? So to us at that point, advertising seemed like the best choice. And, um, but we certainly were concerned about it. It was really hard. It was really hard. We had no idea how will this be perceived? Will there be a backlash? Will, th will, this, will this launch a lot of you know, cynicism about what commercial interests are gonna do to this kind of utopian information environment? Late in 1995, Yahoo began taking banner ads, then held their breath and crossed their fingers. With some trepidation that when we put up our first advertising, there was definitely sort of, oh my gosh, is this gonna work? The agonizing turned out to have been in vain. Yahoo's users just kept on multiplying. And more users meant more advertisers paying more money to put their banner ads in front of the growing number of eyeballs. For the first time, Yahoo had shown it was possible to make money on the web. It was a crucial moment in the story, and it meant one thing, the web boom had begun. It was almost like a starting gun went off on the race. By 1996, Yahoo faced an assortment of challengers that were gaining ground on it. InfoSeq, AltaVista, Lycos. But Yahoo's most formidable rival was a company called Excite. Superficially, Excite seemed an awful lot like Yahoo. It was another search startup founded by another bunch of burrito-eating Stanford kids, substituting a ratty suburban house for a ratty on-campus trailer. But the technology that Excite developed was considerably more sophisticated than that developed by Yahoo. Rather than a list of sites compiled and sorted into categories by human beings, Excite was pure software. When you typed in your query, the service would crawl the web, finding pages that contained the term you'd entered. It was, that is, a rudimentary version of what we think of as search today. When we launched, we were 17th place in a 17-horse race. And we knew that one year from then, we were either going to be number one or number two, or we were going to be dead. Avarice takes over. Ambition, eagerness is in the air. By 1997, the internet was exploding as millions of people flocked online to see what all the excitement was about. Companies like Yahoo, Excite, and the other search engines were busy turning themselves into what were known as portals. One-stop destinations jam-packed with diversions from stock tickers to email to chat rooms. They were online carnivals filled with an array of glittery enticements and trinkets and baubles designed to turn users into a captive audience for the benefit of advertisers. It caused uh, people to engage in really extreme innovation, extreme competition, and, and a very extreme and unsustainable way to live. There was definitely a tit for tat going on. You know, we would launch personalization, Yahoo would launch personalization, Yahoo would launch email, we would launch email. I'm using Yahoo Search to write a book on finger snapping. So it was a bit of a blur in the first few years. Ah! Nobody knew how big this could get. But although the search companies were having great success, they were also turning into something quite different from what they started out to be. By focusing on the flashy flashy, they'd lost sight of what it was that brought users to them in the first place, the need to find things on the ever-expanding web. In other words, the search engine companies stopped caring about search.
Silicon Valley to the streets of San Francisco, the Bay Area was now awash with ambitious techies, pursuing every conceivable web-related opportunity, tackling every conceivable web-related problem, right? No. In fact, the biggest opportunity was still out there, staring the search companies squarely in the face, or they were too blinded by their own success to see it. The problem was, to put it bluntly, that when it came to actually locating relevant information on the web, Yahoo, Excite, and the rest of the so-called search companies, frankly, stunk. You could spend all day typing in various combinations of words to find what you were looking for and still come up empty. Most of the results you'd receive were links to sites trying to sell you something you didn't want, and all too often, smut. In short, the world was hungry for a radically better way of searching the web. Sure enough, it came from the exact same institution that had already produced Yahoo and Excite, Stanford. Once again, the name of the company was unrepentantly goofy, Google, a twist on the word Google, a mathematical term for 10 to the hundredth power. And once again, the founders were a pair of barely socialized young geeks, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. The guys first met in the spring of 1996 on a guided tour of San Francisco for prospective graduate students at Stanford. Leading the tour was Sergey, a good-looking Russian-American kid with a bit of an attitude. I think he was like 19 years old, which is very, very young, one of our youngest PhD students. Well, I remember him as being pretty curt. He sort of, he's the kind of person who has very quick answers to things and sort of sees a certain way. Larry was one of the incoming grad students on the tour that day. A doughy-faced Midwesterner, the son of an academic. His greatest claim to fame to that point was building an inkjet printer out of Legos. He's a very unassuming guy, very quiet. He's not the kind of person who, when you meet him, you say, whoa. I mean, you meet him and you say, here's a nice guy. It was nice guy Larry who had the genius insight that turned search into something magical and launched Google. Given the far-reaching consequences of this insight, social, cultural, and certainly financial, you might think that it's incredibly complex. But in fact, in its basic form, it's pretty simple. His insight started with the notion that the web was running a continual popularity contest on its own content, and that the number of times a given web page was linked to by other sites might be a measure of how useful or how relevant it was. Page believed that a link from one website to another is a kind of recommendation, and he and Bryn built Google's infant search engine around that conviction. As they put it in a now famous academic paper in 1998, quote, in essence, Google interprets a link from page A to page B as a vote by page A for page B. Google assesses a page's importance by the votes it receives, end quote. In other words, when a site about, say, Abraham Lincoln has been linked to 15 million times, that means that an awful lot of people have found it useful. Another Lincoln site that's been linked to, say, 11 times has impressed almost no one. Realizing this, led Page and Brin to their very own version of the dictate, follow the money. In order to find the most relevant sites, what you had to do was count the links. Larry's insight about link counting was simple, but kind of brilliant, and it would eventually be the core of Google's incredible success. But did Larry understand this at the time? Not a chance. The first person ever to see Google in action was one of the boys' computer science professors, Hector Garcia Molina. We played around in my office for a while looking at the in-link counts, as they're called, how many pages point to your page, of interesting pages. So we looked at the Stanford homepage, and then we compared it with other departments, maybe MIT or uh, Berkeley, who are our competitors, uh, and we had lots of fun seeing which of these pages was more important than the others because it was referenced more highly. When Larry and Sergey launched Google onto the Stanford website, Everyone who saw it realized it was something special. Here was a search engine that cared about search again. From their grad student office on the Stanford campus, shown here in this never before seen footage, Page and Brin struggled to manage the runaway popularity of their wondrous innovation. There was so much traffic to Google that it nearly brought the entire Stanford University internet to its knees. And so the university administration said, you must move off campus. Stanford had outlived its usefulness to Larry and Sergey. It was time for them to head off campus and into Silicon Valley proper to look for some cash to turn their bright idea into an honest-to-goodness company. In doing so, they'd be joining thousands of would-be entrepreneurs seeking fame and fortune in the dot-com era Silicon Valley, which meant that the odds were clearly stacked against them.
Today, we look at Google with its stock market value of more than $200 billion, its vast campus in Silicon Valley, and its culture shifting influence. And we assume that there must have been investors banging down the door, especially at the height of the dot com bubble, when some of the dumbest ideas imaginable were being showered with cash. But at the time, the reaction among the money men to Google wasn't, hey, no b Oi, they, not another search engine. One of the few early dissenting voices to this chorus of doubt was that of Vinod Khosla, a hugely successful venture capitalist, tech guru, and one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems. I met them, I loved them, said I'd love to work with them in some way. So I introduced them to Excite. He said, this is a wonderful search engine and a better approach. To Khosla, the logic was simple. At the time, he was an investor in the search company Excite, and he figured that if Excite bought or licensed Google search technology, it would give them an advantage against their bitter rival Yahoo, which seemed to be dominating every battle and vanquishing all of its opponents in the portal wars. If Excite wasn't going to be crushed by Yang and Philo's army, it would need some fresh artillery. As any military commander will tell you, the key to winning a war is striking the right alliances. Now, in the hopes of getting Excite to team up with Google, Kozla arranged a meeting for Excite's chief technologist, Graham Spencer, to meet with Larry and Sergey at this sushi restaurant. The Google boys arrived with high hopes of securing a lifeline for their project. They'd done a test to demonstrate how much better their search results were than Excite's. Now, firing up their laptops, they showed the results to Spencer. Spencer went back and told Excite CEO, George Bell, about Google's technology, and so did Kozla. And there was a lot of resistance. And they'd always come back with a fairly rigid view that search was generic, we can do this, we are almost as good, it doesn't matter. And it wasn't the issue of price, because Google was very cheap. They could have bought it for something like a million dollars. It's worth a hundred billion dollars today. Wait, let's rerun this. Excite could have bought Google for about a million bucks? That's a pittance in Silicon Valley terms. The company had just walked away from what for them would have been the deal of a lifetime. And sure, in hindsight, you know, I'll put my hand up and say, I look dumb. Um, but people didn't think you could make money from search, or people thought you could make some money from search. They certainly didn't think it was a mint. I mean, look, let's be honest, search is a mint. It's a mint. But it wasn't just Excite that failed to see Google's full potential. Every search company in Silicon Valley turned them down flat. So with increasing frustration, Larry and Sergey sought out a professor of theirs from Stanford who happened also to be a serial entrepreneur, a man named David Sheridan. They were after, I think, a fairly modest amount of money in the sort of million dollar range. And I had made some money with this startup that had been bought by Cisco. And I was working with Andy Bechtelsheim, who is well-known uh, Silicon Valley investor. So David called me up and told me I really had to meet these Google guys and um, I uh, drove up to his house. It was a beautiful, you know, summer, sunny morning. Larry and Sergey were desperate now. If David Sheridan and Andy Bechtelsheim didn't see the potential of Google, it was probably time for the Google boys to get back to those PhDs. Larry showed up first and then Sergey showed up and Andy roared up in his Porsche. When I arrived at David's house, uh, Larry and Sergey were already there. So, you know, they jumped right into giving me a demonstration. We met this guy. He quickly, you know, he took a quick look at our search engine. We chatted with him a little bit. They ran him through a demo of, of here's Google and we can type in this and I'm feeling lucky and all those sorts of elements. And it was immediately clear that this was a very, very good idea. I think Andy was sold very quickly on this. In fact, I think this was the best idea I've seen in my entire life. So he said, you know, I don't want you guys to have to, you know, take too low valuation or to have to worry too much about these money things right now. Why don't I just write you a check? So I, I rushed out to my car, pulled out my checkbook and wrote them a check on the spot. Came back with a checkbook and he wrote us a check for $100,000. To Google for $100,000. I think it was Sergey saying, we don't even have a bank account. And Andy saying, well, put it in there when you do. I don't think I've ever written a check on the spot like this before. That was the only time in my life. Let's think about this. How many people do you know who'd be willing to write a $100,000 check on the spot to a couple of mangy grad students? 
I mean, even for a guy like Andy Bechtelsheim, who is worth many millions of dollars, the whole thing seems slightly nuts. But that's the kind of thing that happens here in Silicon Valley. It's why they call the early investors angels. They're in the business of doling out little miracles. Andy was clearly putting a lot of faith in them, not just to not go to Mexico with his money, but they left with an extra level of excitement, as I recall, that we can really do this. Bechtelsheim's investment was followed by checks from a handful of other angels, totaling $1 million. A million dollars must have seemed like a lot of money to a couple of students subsisting mainly on fast food. But as Larry and Sergey would learn soon enough, a million bucks was chicken feed in the boom era Silicon Valley. This skinny Clark Kentish figure is L. John Doerr, arguably Silicon Valley's most famous and successful venture capitalist. Having bankrolled Sun, Compaq, Netscape, and Amazon.com, he's officially the man with the Midas touch. And so it was probably inevitable that Page and Bryn would eventually wind up on Doerr's doorstep. They were so convinced that search was so big, so important, was gonna grow so much, that uh, I asked, uh, so how big? And uh, Larry Page, completely serious, said, well, 10 billion in revenue. Then I did fall out of my chair. I was, I w was certain that uh, these were very ambitious entrepreneurs with a powerful vision. There were few things that floated John Doerr's boat more than outsized ambitions. And even back then, Page and Bryn had ambitions that would make any mere mortal blush. They wanted to organize literally all of the information in the world, make it searchable and universally accessible. Whoa! In the early part of 1999, I got a call from John Doerr saying he wanted me to come on down to his offices. There was something he wanted to show me. I had no idea what he was talking about, but when John Doerr calls, you come. Doerr sat me down behind his desk and told me he'd made an investment in a new startup, a search engine, no less. Then he turned to his computer, fired up his browser, and showed me a website that I'd never heard of before, google.com. The difference was startling, as was Google's radical simplicity, and the results it spit out were remarkably on target. I turned to door and I said, wow, that's impressive, but there aren't any ads on the site, or anything else for that matter. How's this thing ever going to make money? And Dora replied, these guys are solving the single hardest problem on the internet, and if we can't figure out how to make money from that, we ought to get out of this business. But sussing out how Google would become a profitable concern proved to be no easy thing. And as the passing days turned into passing months without a business model, the VCs grew queasier and queasier. There was no means of sustenance for anyone associated with Google. There was no money changing hands. And the founders had to hire people. They had to pay the people. They had to buy equipment to house their service. And all of that required money. Something like half a million bucks was flying out of Google's door each month, which meant that $25 million in the bank wouldn't last for long. The obvious solution was to follow the likes of Yahoo and Excite and put banner ads on their site. But in one of their gutsiest and most far-sighted decisions, Page and Bryn refused to follow the easy path. They simply couldn't stomach the idea of Google turning into just another cluttered portal. They wanted to make sure that they left people uh, with a great experience, but also with advertisements that made sense to people. Page and Bryn weren't against advertising per se. They just wanted it in a more user-friendly, webified form. But they couldn't think of what that would be. Time and money were running out, however. So in the most controversial move of their young company's life, they found the solution to their problem in true Silicon Valley style. They copied it from somebody else. That someone else was this man, Bill Gross. Based down in Los Angeles, Gross had no connection to Google. He ran a small company called Idealab, a self-styled incubator of innovative notions and the startups that hatched them. It was Gross who cracked the riddle of internet advertising and, in a roundabout way, provided Google with its salvation. I go through life looking around at problems that I see and looking for ways to solve them. Whether they're uh, life problems like traffic or health problems or technology problems, but I always like to look at everything and say, how could this be better? 
Over the course of his career, Gross has turned his hand to everything from robots to solar panels. But back in the late 1990s, his obsession was web advertising. When I saw this particular problem at this company, where our companies were looking for ways to advertise more effectively, and I was sort of saying to myself, how can we make this better? What's, the, what's wrong with the way we're buying the advertising right now? What would we like it to be? In hindsight, Gross's insight, like Page's Count the Links, was brilliantly simple. It started with the realization that when someone types in a search query, they're not just telling the world what they're interested in, they're often telling the world what they're interested in buying. So if I type in the words, Bob, Dylan, I'm saying at a minimum that I'm curious about him. Maybe I even want to buy his new album. Now take that information and all the other musicians' names I've ever typed into Google, and suddenly you have a detailed picture of me as a music fan, a picture of no small value to the music business. And this, in essence, is what Bill Gross saw and saw before anyone else, that a search engine could be, and probably would be, the world's most powerful and efficient market research tool. In tech jargon, the terms you type into a search engine are called keywords, and Gross realized that they could be worth a fortune. Keywords are the future of the business. Uh, keywords were so valuable because when a person types in a keyword to a search engine, they are giving you a huge window into the mind of their intent at that moment. You get them to type a few words, that's insanely valuable. Gross believed that he could sell keywords to advertisers. BMW, for instance, would pay good money to ensure that every time someone typed the word car into a search engine, a link to the BMW site appeared up high in the search results. But even among Gross's own people, the idea of paying for placement seemed crass, objectionable. And that was very distasteful to some people in this meeting. There were some people who were rolling their eyes at the idea. They're saying, no way you could get away with that. I said, come on, it's just like the Yellow Pages. Think about that. Think of how useful the Yellow Pages are. And I left the meeting, and I ran back to my office, and I grabbed the Yellow Pages. I brought it back in. I plopped it down. I opened it up. I said, look at this. Look how useful this is. You look for something in here. These are paid ads. And this is what the customer wants when they're searching for a plumber. Why wouldn't we do that in a search engine? Why wouldn't that be helpful? It turned out to be the big idea that search could be like Yellow Pages. Gross ultimately persuaded the skeptics at his company, and in 1998, he launched a site based on keywords and sponsored links that would eventually be known as Overture. It was an instant success. The CEO of the company came up to me and said, we are handling billions of microtransactions. We are bigger than the phone company even in the number of transactions we're handling. And that was really incredible. And then I realized, this really is a big thing. What Gross didn't know was that back in Silicon Valley, his moves were being watched, and that Google would come to see his idea as the solution to its business model quandary. Larry and Sergey uh, happened on a little site that was growing quite nicely um, with sponsored listings called Overture. And Larry in particular, I think, felt that uh, this offered a roadmap for what Google, for a business that Google might be able to get into. The Google boys arranged to meet Bill Gross, and then to meet him again and again. Much of business history is determined by such meetings between aspiring titans meeting behind closed doors. Well, I met Larry and Sergey, and we were talking to them about finding some way to blend the really great monetization that GoTo was having and the incredibly relevant search results that, that Google had. And we talked a number of times about different ways to incorporate those together. Sometimes meetings like this end with both sides emerging arm in arm, but other times not. And that was the case with Google and Overture. What exactly transpired remains a bit of a mystery, but the outlines are clear enough. First, Larry and Sergey walked away from the talks without cutting any kind of deal. And then shortly thereafter, Google released a service called AdWords that was uncannily similar to Overture's. Sound suspicious? You bet it does. Gross sued Google over that similarity and the appropriation it suggested, but ultimately the two sides settled out of court. And one thing's sure, the settlement included enough money in Google stock to keep Bill Gross extremely happy. We thought it would add value. We never thought it could have this kind of impact and reach and really make for such a valuable economic model online, but we're so thrilled that it has. Google would tweak Gross's original idea in important ways. Most crucially, it would separate the ads from the so-called organic search results. Take a look at the Google page that we're all so familiar with by now. Here's the white box where you type in your query. Here are the untainted results generated by the Google relevance algorithm. 
And then here at the top and to the right are the ads, the blue colored sponsored links that companies have paid for. And it's from these that Google has derived billions in profits over the past few years. It was clear that it was a better user experience uh, than arriving at a website that looked as if it was 42nd Street or Times Square at 2 o'clock in the morning. And they thought that would be better for advertisers as well because it would bring advertisers more business. And that was a wonderful, shrewd, stunning, incredible insight uh, in the, at the beginning of 2000. What Google had done wasn't merely to chart a path towards its own commercial success. It had laid the foundations for the astronomical takeoff of internet advertising writ large. Suddenly with AdWords and similar services from Microsoft and Yahoo, anyone who wanted to hawk their goods online, from Toyota and Citibank to a shepherd in the Ural Mountains peddling goatskin rugs, had at their disposal a measurably effective means of reaching a global marketplace. What we now understand is the internet economy was being born with Google as its most essential player. On August 19th, 2004, Google went public, listing its shares for sale on the NASDAQ stock market. In the previous five years, the company had gone from zero to a staggering $3 billion annually in revenue, and had become a household name. The Google IPO caused a frenzy of speculation and anticipation, especially among those who hoped, prayed, it might revive a tech sector still recovering from the dot-com crash. Out in Silicon Valley, a commonly seen bumper sticker around the time read, please just give us one more bubble. But the way that Google conducted its offering aroused the ire of many and led to talk on that fateful day of a disaster in the making. I remember that morning sitting in a conference room with a television watching people on uh, CNBC talking about what a terribly unsuccessful offering this was going to be and how unlikely we were to be successful. The controversy over the IPO arose from the fact that Google had chosen an unconventional auction process for selling its shares. And this had alienated much of Wall Street, which profited handsomely from the conventional way of doing business. Google's roadshow to drum up interest in the IPO in the financial community earned terrible reviews. The company's executives came across as arrogant and unforthcoming. The Google IPO was quite the talk of financial media, and there were many powerful forces on Wall Street who believed this was not the way they wanted public offerings to be done. The great and the good of Wall Street were in that conference room in the NASDAQ tower in Times Square. So were John Doerr, Eric Schmidt, Larry Page, and me. The tension was thick, and the only thing that cut it was when Larry planted his soon-to-be billion-dollar butt in a plate full of creme fraiche. It's surreal. There's this enormous wall of pixels and graphics, and you have some sense that here's the whole world's economy uh, sweeping across your eyes. And then up onto the stage go uh, uh, Larry and Eric. And uh, there was a great deal of anticipation about the market opening. And then off they went. And of course, at noon, the trading turned on, and the first trade was at $100, $15 higher than the previous day's price, and it never went below that. In the end, despite all the Sturm und Drang, the Google IPO was a success by the measure that matters most. Anyone who bought shares that day and is still lucky or smart enough to have them has made a whopping bundle. Three years after the offering, Google was valued more highly than FedEx, McDonald's, Coke, Intel, IBM, or Walmart. Shares that traded at $100 had soared to nearly $700. Meanwhile, Brennan Page are ranked among the top 30 richest people in the world. Google, full stop, is the fastest growing company ever. Despite racing into the Fortune 500, Google's founders have always been at pains to ensure that their company isn't perceived as yet another rapacious bully, like, say, Microsoft at its zenith. Their ostentatiously altruistic corporate motto is, don't be evil. Their campus is a throwback to the dot-com era, 
with its free food, beanbag chairs, and Segway scooters. But for all the feel-good fripperies, Google remains a highly tuned capitalist machine, one that continues to thrive on the marriage of search and advertising that the company has perfected. Until advertising online was really effective, there was no way to pay for all the programmers who were building all the software. They were subsidized. So for example, at Sun, we would sell systems or hardware, and we would use that money to pay for our internet programmers. The internet businesses today can pay for their internet programmers with internet revenues, which are typically advertising. So the development of the technology and the advertising go hand in hand. But Google isn't kicking back and milking its core business. It's not resting on its laurels. Quite the contrary. It knows full well that to stand still in the technology business is to commit commercial suicide. Google has poured its gargantuan profits into countless experiments and projects, sticking its fingers into every pie within its reach. There's Google Library, Google Books, Google Maps, and Google Earth. There's Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Spreadsheets, and Google Docs. The company bought the startup Blogger for personal web publishing. It bought the startup Picasa for online photo sharing, and of course, YouTube for online video sharing. It all adds up, in the eyes of many, to a plan for world domination. And so it's no wonder that Google mania has gradually started to give way to creeping Google phobia. Where the sense of Google phobia may be most acute is among privacy crusaders who worry about how much information about all of us is stored in Google's databases. But it's not just civil libertarians. Even Page and Brin's original mentors have their worries. People are going to feel that there really is a danger in having too much information stored about everything they've done, everything they've searched for. Uh, and we're going to see more and more about that. For others, Google's metastasizing dominance and ravenous expansion is a call to arms. Although Excite is long dead, Yahoo has ramped up its search and advertising offerings. And also making its mission to take down Google is Microsoft, a company well known for never giving up, for coming late to the party, but always being the last man standing. Generally, if there was a large internet or software opportunity, uh, Microsoft would figure that out pretty quickly. And they have uh, a lot of really smart people and enormous assets and strengths. More to the point, as Google has expanded its reach into so many corners of commerce, its list of enemies outside the tech business has grown longer and more formidable. From Viacom and Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation to book publishers and soon enough, the entire telecommunications industry. The forces now amassing against Google will confront the company with challenges far greater than any it's ever caught up against before. For Google to continue its astonishing rocket ride, Larry and Sergey and the rest of the Googlers will need to be nimble and innovative and endlessly creative. What the history of high tech tells us is that every company, no matter how great, eventually screws up big time. And while that hasn't happened to Google yet, it's inevitable that it will. Google has come farther and faster than any company ever before, but its biggest battles and the true test of its mettle still lay ahead. Thank <laughs> you.